Wait, remember Code Lyoko? I sure do. My comment section sure does. And this fellow over here does too. That's Billiam. He's a fan of long foreheads, just like me. He's talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> Code Lyoko was a French animated series that focused on a group of kids who constantly have to save the world from an onslaught of attacks from a violent and angry computer virus called Xana. It premiered on September 3rd, 2003 on France 3 and premiered in the US on Cartoon Network half a year later on April 19th, 2004. And now, nearly two decades later, a couple of YouTubers are still talking about it. Wow, the internet is fun! Code Lyoko drops you right into the action and lets you infer over various episodes and piece together the world in which this takes place. A group of four friends, Yumi, Ulrich, Odd, and Jeremy, all have befriended a presumed AI girl named Aelita. Aelita exists in a virtual reality world called Lyoko, which is also home to that evil virus named Xana. Xana seems to stop at nothing to destroy the human dimension and through various technological means is able to take over and manipulate various parts of the physical world. The group must enter Lyoko and assist Aelita in reaching various towers to rid Xana of his command by entering Code Lyoko. Oh my god, that's like the name of the show. Due to Aelita's predicament, they are all constantly working towards manifesting her into the real world. It's a quest to make her a material girl slay, but her backstory gets even more interesting, so it just you wait. With the show being available in over 10 languages, having major success in 150 countries, and massive worldwide acclaim in all forms of entertainment from the show to video games and of course the toy market, this has easily been the most requested show that I cover here on the channel. So what better way than to jump into the multi-animation style show than mix my 2D self with a live action friend? Yeah, this is Billiam. Yeah, it is. And today on on both of our channels, we are teaming up to enter the world of Code Lyoko, explore a bunch of what the show and beyond had to offer, and maybe, just maybe, see about getting some forehead extensions of our own. We're beautiful. No need to worry, Jeremy. We're used to this. Now a word from our sponsor. Thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video. Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network that helps you secure your digital life in turn helping your real life by putting your worries at ease. Surfshark offers one of the best full coverage VPN packages out there with an unlimited number of devices that can all run under one subscription, all at the same time. Seriously, as many devices as you want. The Surfshark app itself is available on all platforms, PC, Mac, and of course the Linux users out there, you're covered as well. Even smart TVs and video game companies. Consoles, all along with 24-7 live customer support and a full 30-day money-back guarantee to make sure you know it's completely risk-free by giving them a shot, as well as one of the best security measures with their strictly no-logs policy which encrypts your data, meaning that they do not keep any of it, nor does anyone know what you're doing online. Want to watch something that isn't streaming in your country? <laughs> no worries. Just connect to any of the servers Surfshark has around the world and boom, you can access streaming libraries of even more content that otherwise would not be available in your country. It's fast and it's easy to use, filled with features that go beyond just the basics with a regular VPN. If you want to protect yourself online while browsing, as well as help support the channel, you can get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deal slash jordanfringe, and enter promo code jordanfringe for 83% off in an extra three months for free. So click the link down below in the description and get protected today. Say that again? Our main focus in the show is this group of friends that are all very different but bring a lot to the table in terms of skill and knowledge. Jeremy is the tech aficionado of the group, often compared to a genius given the Einstein poster in his room. That's always a clear sign. He is the one that controls the jump to the virtual reality of Lyoko and oversees his friends in their intense battles with various monsters that roam the land. While he doesn't actively fight in Lyoko, his job is incredibly important to the team. And throughout the early episodes, we meet the full team like Yumi, who has proven to be an intelligent kid and a fast learner, but is also kind of an outcast at the school. Because of her slow burn romance with Ulrich, she garners the attention from the popular girl at school, Sissy, who is also the principal's daughter. Despite harassment from her peers, she is able to shake things off very easily and is not often phased by anything. She ventured into the Yoko quite a bit, and a lot of the fans point out how many times she has been the victim of attacks in both the physical world and in Lyoko. But her telekinetic abilities come in handy very often in saving her life and the lives of her friends. 
Ulrich is dubbed the most attractive boy in the school, which makes him quite popular with everyone, especially Cece. He is fairly introverted and quite competitive, which results in him being the most immature of the group, which is surprising considering that Odd is also there too. Ulrich joins Yumi and Odd in Lyoko and proves to be an extremely skilled fighter with cloning abilities and super speed. Odd is the blonde and purple haired kid who definitely stands out most in their group, accompanied by his dog Kiwi. Despite his unique appearance, Odd proves to be unapologetic and very confident in himself. He is often used as a comedic relief and is characterized as messy and toxic occasionally due to his self-centeredness. He ventures into Lyoko the most out of all of them and seems to rival Ulrich in terms of fighting skills. Yumi also seems to rival Ulrich in fighting skills, and maybe a bit more. But Odd's shielding power ends up being quite the lifesaver. But at least for his design, he is definitely the one that stands out the most and is the most memorable character. Lastly, Aelita is a young pink haired girl who was later revealed to not have originally been artificial intelligence at all, but a human turned virtual being. She has proven her selflessness countless times and sees the world in a very unbiased way. She is intelligent and quick witted in her ability to dodge or sneakily destroy monsters without attacking them head on. She is also very naive and easily gets her feelings hurt, which allows her to grow and change as a character as she adapts to the real world outside of Lyoko. Yeah, they are able to bring her back to the real world thanks to Jeremy creating a way to materialize her, making her a character who, just like the others, can go between both worlds. In fact, Aelita's whole story is incredibly fleshed out. 22 years before the events of the show itself, Aelita was born. Through some time passing when living and being homeschooled by her dad, who has a mysterious supercomputer, they are both tracked down by two men in black as they make their escape to an abandoned factory, the same one that becomes the secret base for the Lyoko warriors during the events of the show itself. To keep his daughter and himself safe, once there, he scans them both into the virtual world, thus putting them in Lyoko, where Xana is already trying to hunt them down. So this is something that the father needs to fix. In an effort to stop Xana when all else fails, and for Xana to not escape and attack the real world, he begs his daughter to never forget him, shutting off the supercomputer and trapping Aelita inside for the next 10 years. Yeah, it's quite a lot to handle, but it sets up a pretty fascinating backstory for the character, and the main course of the plot. Plot. Other than her, we do have another person to mention though. In the second season, we are also introduced to William, a loner kid who sparks a romance with Yumi in conflict with Ulrich. He was kicked out of his last school for leaving love letters all around. Hopeless romantic or weird creep? That's up for you to decide. His character is pretty interesting in general though, as he is full of angst and eventually joining on to the group thanks to the majority of them accepting him in to fight alongside them, especially since Xana is growing stronger and the help is greatly needed. Though even at one point when William is helping, Xana takes control of his body and mind, turning him into a temporary villain until he was freed later on. To avoid suspicion at their school in the meantime, Jeremy is able to create a clone essentially to fill in for him based on downloaded memories and the clone becomes the opposite of a loner. In fact, he becomes quite popular, which sets up more of the school-based situations. It's like several shows at once, combining the thrilling 3D animated action and 2D moody school drama. The voice acting, aside from the animation, is the first thing you'll notice, as it definitely seemed like a mixed bag of characters that didn't feel like they were all in the same place talking to one another. I don't have frog's legs, that's just the way I walk! <laughs> Why are you yelling? Well, at least I can watch the French version. De pièces mécaniques de circuits électriques qui pourraient sans doute me. Uh, great, now I gotta read. After all, it is your job. Join the battle against Santa, Code Lyoko style. Join us. The fate of Lyoko is up to you. The animation style, or styles, is probably the most recognizable thing about the show. The settings and backgrounds are beautifully painted with a soft detail that is associated with Japanese anime while keeping a uniquely French aspect to it, drawing a lot of influence from Serial Experiments Lane, a late 90s anime that has quite a bit of the same themes we see from Code Lyoko, only a bit darker. You can notice a lot of the color palettes resemble the look of the show in spirit, as well as the technology in general with how it looks and operates. The characters are heavily stylized with large foreheads. Large foreheads and, oh yeah, large foreheads. Sorry, I literally can't see past the large foreheads because they are blocking the view. Funny, for something like Oban Star Racers, we talked about the distinct feature of 
having no noses. And here in Code Lyoko, the distinctive feature is having enough room to play tic-tac-toe between someone's eyes and hairline. There is something that connects that though, which we will go into shortly. And I'm not talking about the tic-tac-toe connection, I'm talking about Oban Star Racers to Code Lyoko. It should definitely be noted though that this show was one of the first shows to utilize the combination of both 2D and 3D animation, which is something that is a bit of a controversial decision in the animation community. Most times, having 3D assets on a 2D landscape is something that stands out aggressively and for some can ruin the scenes it's utilized in. However, this show separates the two by one being the real world and the other a digital one, which is a pretty smart way to incorporate it all. It's like how in Breaking Bad we know when the scenes are in New Mexico versus the scenes that take place in Mexico based on the shots in Mexico being just very yellow. Now you have to remember that this was the early 2000s where 3D animation was still early on for a lot of the cartoons jumping on board with it. It would be cheaper to animate than standard 2D animation but came at a cost sometimes with the most apparent thing in the show being the almost wasteland-esque feelings that lifeless 3D environments would often bring. That's not to say that the show didn't offer some really awesome 3D action in more detailed environments, it's just that it becomes more noticeable the more you watch. Contrasting with how detailed and nicely colored the 2D were world's environments are, it just sticks out like how cool and interesting Billiam's live-action backdrop looks, and my teal backdrop with floating particles. Uh, maybe I should hang up a picture or something. Ah, there we go. The characters and concept had taken a while to develop. Creators Tanya Palumbo and Thomas Romain were both attending the Goblin School of Visual Communication and Arts in France. Contrary to popular belief, it's not a school where they teach you to go goblin mode, unfortunately. The two of them created the animated short that runs just under a minute titled Les Enfants Font Le Cinéma, which in English translates to The Children Make Their Movies. The short depicts a young boy running through the streets of what looks like a dystopic and dilapidated city. He delivers a roll of film to a group of children that have gathered together in an abandoned building, but have created a movie theater setup. Many of the children there that we see look exactly like the characters we would also see in Garage Kids and get to know and love in Code Lyoko. Garage Kids would have been the next step in their process. After their short premiered at the International Film Festival of Annecy in 2000, they were approached and started to begin production on Garage Kids, which premiered in 2001. This next short was a bit longer, with a five minute runtime. We get to hear the characters speak and see the bones of the story and setting that Code Lyoko adapts. With a virtual reality as well, this short is very much like Code Lyoko with a few differences. The main one being the changes in Lyoko, which isn't even called Lyoko, it's called Xanadu. So here's a little bit of a history lesson into where this word comes from. Kublai Khan, the fifth Kangen Emperor of the Mongol Empire. Xanadu is actually the name of a location, specifically the summer capital of the Yun Dynasty, also known as Shangdu. The location itself was popularized in modern vocabulary with the help of poet Samuel Taylor Coolridge in 1816. In his poem titled Kublai Khan, there he metaphorically refers to Xanadu as an idyllic and opulent place. Today, Xanadu serves as the name for a series Series of experimental homes that were built in the late 1970s, with the purpose of computers being used in the houses. In modern day, we would call them smart houses, and to an extent, some of us live in some form of these type of houses today. Well, sh I'm still terrified of smarter than me houses since the movie Smart House had Leela torture a single father and his kids. So it seems that technology has adopted the concept a bit more in terms of Xanadu being a utopia, which seemingly would fit right into the computer generated virtual reality. If only Xanadu or Lyoko weren't as terrifying and monster ridden as it was. It could be that the reality is named ironically, but I would prefer to speculate that it was initially created to be a virtual utopia that the Xana malware or virus has since then corrupted. Now known as a failed utopia or a temporary dystopia soon to be cleansed by the Lyoko warriors. Xanadu is also speculated to be where our main villain Xana gets their name from. Written frequently in an acronymic form, fans have speculated and thrown out guesses after guesses of what it could truly mean. But the fact of the matter is, no one really knows. In an interview with writer Sophie de Crisset, she admits that by the time she started working on the series, a lot of the characters were already named 
owned by Tanya and Thomas, the original creators. This included Xana, but then again, as Xana could be the product of Xanadu itself, they most likely got his name from a developing concept of their old virtual reality in Garage Kids. So the acronym is just kind of left in the air to what it really means. Other differences between Xanadu and Lyoko are in size. Lyoko is vast, multi-biome landscape with different terrains, whereas Xanadu is mainly referring to a small bit of land held up by cords and cables, with a few scattered towers on top. Lyoko has smaller, yet more spread out towers. That total to about 85, most likely to make it more interesting, given that our main characters have to enter and do something new and interesting in every episode. The changes in production from Garage Kids to Ko Lyoko actually resulted in creator Thomas Romain leaving in the pre-production process, due to differing opinions as to how the project should go, as well as pursuing some of his other interests, he left and began to work on other various anime and shows like Oban Star Racers, for example. See, there was a reason I brought that up earlier. Before leaving, though, he did spend time working on the show's literary and graphical bible with Tanya, in order to make sure the look of the show and the story have an actual path to follow along. Tanya, on the other hand, did stick a little closer to the series, but took a step back similar to Thomas and continued to help just with artistic direction and creative management. In fact, the initial fans of the show helped shape and mold the future of Ko Lyoko past season one, where the creators would get in touch with the audience hearing out their thoughts and wants through online message boards, which actually turned into the series Bible translating into some pretty cool things like the general concept of the Lyoko Warriors being called the Lyoko Warriors. Yeah, the fans of the show adopted calling them that name before it would even be used in an official way in the show itself. A very risky but cool way the writer Sophie de Crisset and director Jeremy Muscadet found a way to keep fans involved beyond just being supportive, and in return giving back a little bit of fan service. Once the series Bible is set, changing it during the show's run is something that can easily get very messy and result in it all falling apart, but the changes ended up being for the better. Ko Lyoko would be a part of the Maguzi animation block on Cartoon Network as a way to fulfill the weekday mid-afternoon lack of Toonami, which had switched over to being a Saturday night cartoon and anime block. The Maguzi block would include a large range of different shows, in which Billiam will be deep diving more into what Maguzi is and what it encompassed. And I won't even need a snorkel, I'm much more accustomed to the pinch nose method. <laughs> But for Ko Lyoko's time on the air during its fourth season, the final seven episodes were never aired on Cartoon Network, but rather distributed online only on Cartoon Network's website. If your access to the show in the States was only catching it on TV, you were left with only questions. And in 2007, the internet was still in its infancy with hosting videos compared to where we're at today. What was the main cause of this? It's different from not getting renewed or canceled. The ending to the animated show for many was just simply taken away from TVs. It doesn't even seem to be for ratings or toys, which I'll touch on those a little bit later, but for the fact that a singular Cartoon Network executive just didn't like the show. Simple as that. Which is wild considering how close it was to just finishing its fourth season. Why not just, I don't know, wait a tiny bit longer? You have this amazing Tron and Matrix inspired show with incredible cool and unique character design and you take that away from me? That's just cruel. Well, another thing that could have been an issue is some of the content in the show. While being rated as TVY7 in the US, this was a French show where in which they are a lot more chill about certain things being in their shows. Which is why there are more more risque shots or more mature moments. Although a lot of the show remained untouched, some parts were cut for the violence being too much and would push past the rating and even some nudity related reasons like Odd exposing himself or being in control of Yumi's body and making her kiss Ulrich. Yeah, I understand why those didn't make the final cut. Moonscoop themselves made that decision. But in general, the show, still here in the US, was cut just a tad short from nearing the end of season four. Sure, you could find them online if you knew about it, but it still was a weird way to handle what would be the end of the show. So before we look into the future of Code Lyoko post the original animated series, we need to go back and get some answers about the world of Lyoko and how our Lyoko warriors came together in the first place. I couldn't care less. Moon Scoop Distribution presents Code Lyoko. And now back to Code Lyoko.
Halfway through Kolioko's run of four seasons, we were given a two-part prequel titled Xana Awakens, taking place a few weeks before the events of the show's first episode. When we start Kolioko at episode one, it's more of just throwing us into the mix rather than going into the full-on reasons for the events of the show. Serving as a proper introduction, we get to see how this group of friends came to be and all about how Jeremy ended up finding Aelita. As Jeremy finds himself at the abandoned factory trying to find some parts for the robot miniatures he was working on, he runs into the turned off supercomputer that we already know houses the world of Lyoko, but also the trap digitalized Aelita. Once he decides to activate it because of his curiosity, he is met with the girl trapped in the computer, pink hair and all. But him not having the funds to support her on a tier 3 sub level decides that he must save her from this world. Okay, not quite yet, but we do get to see how Odd and Ulrich meet one another. And they were roommates. We also meet Sissy, who is swooning over Ulrich, but he is clearly showing no signs of reciprocating those emotions. In fact, he even calls her a brain-dead leech. She's totally brain-dead and a leech as well. Ow. Ow. But back to Jeremy and his new AI friend, who he calls Maya, as she questions him about where she is and why she is there due to her memory loss. But during their conversations figuring out the lay of the Lyoko land, she is attacked by some creatures causing her to run back into the tower she ventured out from, which to their surprise starts healing her life points back up. This seems like a banned strategy in Yu-Gi-Oh. We also get introduced to Yumi. Well, in a way, we see her purchasing from a vending machine while Ulrich creepily checks her out as odd as annoying him. Him. Oh, and then Jeremy walks up to the vending machine and gets electrocuted. Ulrich ends up helping him and bringing him to the nurse to be checked up on, transitioning to now we get to see Yumi get a full better introduction. During the class, we get to see how Yumi and Ulrich will form some sort of will-they-won't-they they relationship going forward. A little bit of groundwork being laid out. We see Jeremy once again being attacked by other forms of technology, causing Ulrich to question him about what the heck is going on, bringing him along to the factory, explaining to him the whole concept of Lyoko and introducing him to Maya. Beyond this, Jeremy goes on to talk about the virtualization chambers, but they need someone to test them to see if the possibility of going into Lyoko is even possible. Ulrich tries taking Odd's dog Kiwi, which has Odd tracking him down, and for some reason, Cece is following him too because she wants some alone time with him. Like, girl, take a hint. But right before they could send the poor defenseless dog into Lyoko as their guinea pig, Odd jumps into the capsule as the dog jumps out and the doors close in. I know longer feel bad for that little dog. What a selfish jerk. Ah, never mind. Look how cute he is trying to get Odd still inside. All is forgiven, little one. For now. Odd gets sent into the forest biome of Lyoko dressed up as a giant purple cat, as he puts it. And look, it's Kiwi on his shirt. Welcome to Watch Mojo's Top 10 Details You Missed in Code Lyoko. Number 10, Dog. Jeremy can speak to Odd from the computer into the world, but Odd is quickly attacked by some of the same creatures that went after Maya. Ulrich jumps into a pod to get sent in for backup, and on the outside, more technology is attacking Jeremy. And Sissy, who is just still being annoying. While running away from the creatures and into the tower where they stupidly fall into a void, that they end up casually walking out into an icy environment to be attacked by even more creatures. And during this battle, both Odd and Ulrich get defeated, losing their life points sending them back to the land of 2D, where they now have to help the others fighting back against the attacking technology. Oh, and if you noticed, Odd's hair in the real world was flowing down and relaxed, but after experiencing Lyoko, he styles it up, giving him his iconic look we all know and love or are just fascinated with. Back in Lyoko, we seemingly get a tour of different areas within the land as Maya is on the run from a mysterious presence and the various creatures of Lyoko. In the outside world, electronics are still attacking, completely electrocuting Sissy. Now the debate about her deserving it is completely up to you, I won't judge. We cut back to Yumi and Ulrich who are now training once more, continuing to have some more awkward moments together. But the tension is broken up once this electric ball starts chasing them. All of the characters come together and meet up in a fast pursuit back to the computer to get back in and help Maya any way they can. We also get this really cool 360 shot around Yumi and I think this is peak awesome for the animation. And then Odd, Ulrich, and Yumi all jump in to Lyoko. Sissy, who wakes up and starts to tell her dad, you know, the principal, about the secret factory and supercomputer. See, this is why we don't like Sissy. She's a snitch. Oh, but it's to save her friends. They don't even like her, dude. Chill. The battle intensifies on Lyoko, causing the soon-to-be warriors to be kicked back to the real world one by one. When the adults and Sissy get there, they are immediately attacked by the massive electro ball as Maya enters into the tower after scanning her hand, finds 
finds out her real name is actually Aelita, and the code Lyoko gets entered, stopping the electrical attack on the outside. As the adults are now demanding the shutting off of the computer, Jeremy makes a last second decision and starts hitting the keyboard hacker style while yelling, return to the past now, where we pick back up at the school before all the brunt of this whole Lyoko stuff even happens. When Ulrich is just chilling, watching Yumi at the vending machine, only now do they retain their memories of what had happened and are just as confused as everyone watching. How did the computer become a time machine of sorts all of a sudden? Well, it actually is a main thing that happens in the series at the end of practically every episode. It's just one of those quirky little things that the supercomputer can do, allowing them to kind of reset everything by a day or two. Well, Jeremy didn't remember the events of what happened aside from his previous knowledge of just discovering Lyoko and Maya. They all came to the conclusion that this may be because he has never been virtualized into Lyoko while the other three were. But now the mission is all set. The group is put together and the search for a way to bring Aelita to the real world has begun. But before we venture into the start of the series in general, we learn about Xana, an electrical controlling virus that through the use of many towers throughout Lyoko can affect objects in the real world. The only way to combat Xana is shutting down the towers being used, thanks to Aelita's abilities to enter code Lyoko. And that's our look into the origins of this friend group of Lyoko warriors, how they all met, the explanations of how they found Lyoko and got inside, and what set up where the series would go. Honestly, it was a pretty fun look into getting some more character development and why some characters are like they are. But just as the world needed a proper reintroduction, going beyond Code Lyoko's main series, there was still plenty more to come. I hate to burst your bubble, but it sounded like sarcasm. Yoko now continues. After the show's fourth season ended, there were still a few unanswered questions and plot holes that hadn't been addressed. Fans were overjoyed on May 31st, 2011, when Code Lyoko Evolution was announced. The reboot continuation revival aired the following year on December 12th, 2012. Fans were surprised to see that the style decision for depicting the physical world was not animation at all, but live action, just like Billiam over there. Although the 3D computer animation had noticeably been improved when they were in Lyoko, fans were still unimpressed by the changes that the series made in Evolutions. Many people have expressed that the live action takes away from the charm that the initial four seasons had. There was also a noticeable difference in how the characters acted. The characters we knew and loved had changed a bit. I actually thought that the casting was fairly impressive and true to what the animated versions of them looked like, minus the mile-long foreheads. But regardless, they still acted out of character, which made the series a bit more difficult to enjoy. A lot of fans have decided to reject the reboot due to it being off-putting, and also because it introduced even more plot holes and didn't do anything to tie together where the animation left off, especially as the series acted as a continuation one year later post-season 4. Instead, there was a series of four books called Code Lyoko Chronicles that were released in 2009 and 2010. The series of books were introduced to pick up after season 4 and in a way to address and fill in plot holes from the animated series. With the books, however, they were all released only in Italian even though the show was originally French, only having the first two books out of the four translated into French. At least the toy market across Code Lyoko was pretty booming across the planet, similar to how massive the toy and merchandise market was for Totally Spies around the world, just not as successful as that. But still, not a thing to be overlooked. Many of these toys being split in between regions as exclusives never releasing outside of various countries. Stuff like action figures, remote control characters, travel bags, DVDs, glassware, keychains, magazines, bikes, Beyblade ripoffs, cell phone attachments, bedspreads, winter gear, heck, a fake computer to fulfill your Lyoko exploration needs. But you can't forget about the balloons. And not every intellectual property gets an addition to a theme park in France, now do they? No they don't. In addition to the books and literature and the toys, lots of Code Lyoko games were created. There was a card game released in 2006 that has been compared to Yu-Gi-Oh with over a hundred cards in it. Additionally, Code Lyoko Quest for Infinity was released for the Nintendo Wii, PlayStation 2, and PSP. There was, just simply titled, Code Lyoko and then Code Lyoko Fall of Xana, which were both released in 2007 for the Nintendo DS. Thanks to the overall concept of Code Lyoko Reloaded, which would be an encompassing list of brand building ideas from the books, a website, and an MMORPG that would get some steam along moving forward and was planned to be released in the summer of 2012. But that MMO project went kaput, and a lot of the fans of Code Lyoko aren't too mad about that 
fact as the game took a lot of liberties in redesigning the look of the characters, to the point that the only thing that resembled Code Lyoko was the title. But I must admit, a real Code Lyoko MMORPG that looks and feels like the show sounds pretty rad. I'm trying to get in on some of that. Later on, we would get the Code Lyoko social game, which released initially on Facebook in 2012. It later migrated to an independent site, which is odd since it used purchasable Facebook credits for in-game content. It actually lasted for quite some time, only fully being shut down in September of 2018. What about Flash games? Yeah, of course there were. They include Code Lyoko Race, Lost Lost on Lyoko, anti xana Formation, Hornet Attack, Death of the Hornets, Monster Swarm, Aelita's Battle, and many, many more. Fans also took it upon themselves to create their own fan-made games, examples of which include IFSCL, a simulated fictional interface of the Code Lyoko supercomputer, or IFSCL. Wow, that title makes a lot of sense. Thanks to the reloaded concept in general announced in 2008, there was a lot more planned in terms of the TV show. A leaked document in 2011 revealed that a Originally, the Reloaded concept housed the idea for the Revival reboot continuation to just be like the original series, part 2D and part 3D animation only now picking back up with the characters in high school to further both their digital and physical arcs. Sadly, this idea never came to fruition, and instead their other idea they were working on fully came to be, which was Code Lyoko Evolutions, the live action version. But the potential for the expansion of Code Lyoko goes beyond just some of the games or a continuation of the show. I mentioned in my first Ben 10 video that there was a Ben 10 challenge game show. Well, two of them, technically. But it also seems that there was going to be a game show for Code Lyoko called Code Lyoko Challenge. It would consist of a team of 10 to 11 year old players who are given the opportunity to become the heroes at the center of the show's simulated concepts. Through these challenges, the team would face off against Xana, the AI itself, with a promise from the show that the game show will be equally as fun to watch as it is to play. Teamwork, hard challenges, challenges, puzzle solving, memory retention, and physical effort are what wait ahead for the contestants in this promised futuristic looking fast paced game show. It was set to launch in the fall of 2012, literally 10 years ago, and nothing ever came of this, even with the fast turnaround time for recordings that they had promised. Suffice to say that there was a lot planned according to this reloaded structure for the series. Code Lyoko was, and still today in parts of the world, is a massive brand. And I wouldn't be surprised if something stirs back up in the entertainment realm for Code Lyoko, whether it be more books, video games, a game show, or a new animated show. But because the series was already given a technical second chance with Evolution being the main thing from the reloaded plan that came to be, which also obviously didn't perform very well, it's highly unlikely that we'll ever see the Lyoko Warriors again. But I won't give up hope on that. Put me down for a spot in line if it ever does. Or if the Code Lyoko live show that was part of Festival Del Clan TV and Canal Panda Festival makes a return. I'll buy a ticket. But what do you think about Code Lyoko? Were you entranced by its blending of 2D and 3D animation? Let me know all your thoughts down below in the comments. As well as if this wasn't enough Code Lyoko goodness for you today, my friend Billiam and I work together on this video and on his new Code Lyoko video out now where you can find even more deep dives into the Code Lyoko Wii game, the Maguzi block the show was played on, and a further look into the sequel series, Code Lyoko Evolution. I'm gesturing for somebody to come over. Stupid. <laughs> so click the link down below or the pop-up card in the corner to stay in the world of Lyoko just a bit longer. And trust me, it'll be worth it. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this, or I'll trap you in a digital world until some large four-headed kids come and save you. Click the join button to become a member and help support the channel. Follow me on Twitter, and I'll be back with another video soon. But until then, later. Jordan, Jordan friends, collaborating with me. We've had such a good time. I'm glad you can see. See ya! <laughs> <laughs> see ya!